So what form do you take exosomes in? I mean, because what you were describing there was like a topical form, but they can also be injected for kind of more systemic effect. Well, right now we're only regulated as a topical product. Our application to the FDA for COVID is an intravenous injection. Um, I am I'm also of the opinion that sub-Q injections are going to be even more important um, because what you're trying to target is the lymphatic system. And you don't necessarily do that by injecting them IV. By injecting them IV, they'll go straight to the spleen, which we have mouse models to demonstrate that. Uh, but if you have psoriasis or, or some inflammation in your foot, you know, the lymph nodes for that are much closer than the spleen. So you might propose a sub-Q injection around the inguinal lymph nodes, you know, so, or if you have alopecia areata, where, which is an inflammatory disease, where do you try to target that? Do you microneedle around the lymph nodes and, and just apply it topically such that it can, it can traffic? Because they're so small, they will get through any opening. It doesn't have to be very big. And they would rapidly traffic to the lymph nodes by, via the lymphatic system. So that route of administration is, is something to be discussed. Um, but we certainly know that it works topically. If you create a topical wound right here, you can find the exosomes in the lymph node within five minutes just by placing them on topically. So um, that's, that's a route. Microneedling of the face works very, very well just by applying topically. But we're working on another model right now that we're very excited about, which is the use of a focused ultrasound on an area of the brain, say the hippocampus, um, and then IV administration of the exosome such that they can traffic preferentially to the brain, which is what anti-aging really is or requires, right? Um, so we've just demonstrated this in rats that the focused ultrasound, this is at the City of Hope in Los Angeles, that the focused ultrasound rat had a much greater concentration of exosomes in the brain than uh, a non-focused ultrasound treated. Now the ultrasound, what that means is you put a transducer on the skull and it sends a, a focused cone of energy of just a few inches into your brain. And you can target an area of stroke with that, which is actually FDA approved for. Um, you can target, like I said, hypothalamus, you can target an area of cell death. Um, and that way you can sort of regrow the brain, which by regrowing the brain, you'll start to regrow the body because the brain will think it's, yeah. The, the, the product, is it like something that people can buy or is it, it, does it have to go through a doctor and it's, it needs to be prescribed? Uh, we generally go through physicians. Um, it doesn't need to be prescribed because it's not regulated by the FDA. It's not a scheduled drug or anything like that. Um, that's why it's, it's, it's a hard thing to regulate. You, you're regulating it right now for the ability to market towards an indication. Mm -hmm. But milk has exosomes in it. So you can't say that milk is a scheduled drug. Even worse, milk has cow exosomes in it. Um, you're not prescribing it for the, for the growth of young human beings, you know? Um, so it, that, that's a two edge. That's, it's a very complicated word. I'm just used describing exosomes because that's what these small particles are, but there are so many different types of exosomes that you'd have to say, do your placental mesenchymal stem cell exosomes, what were you trying to use those for and, and how can you administer those? So. Right, and so you did say that you were seeking FDA approval and I believe right. that you know the FDA have looked at your lab and product that Chimera Labs produces is, is consistent enough to, to be like approved. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very stringent nowadays. If you think about when I started, it was just me. Um, Fortunately, I've had my quality control uh, group now go back and look at the first files that I've made, and they have the same concentration of exosomes that we have currently. So that's, that's a bright side. Um, but to be certain of what we have has taken us a long time, and it probably won't end anytime soon. You know, We have nine or 10 different ways of characterizing these exosomes. Um, we don't talk about number of exosomes anymore uh, because that's not valid. Um, so we talk about the concentration of RNA. We talk about the concentration of protein. We put that into a factor. It's called a ROS unit. And, um, and then we sell the product like that in terms of units. But again, it's based on, say, 
So if Moderna is just RNA, they sell that in terms of micrograms of RNA. But the exosomes are RNA and protein, and they're both important. So how do I describe that? Because I can't talk about the weight of the proteins versus the weight of the RNA. I mean, which one's more important? They're both important. That's why we had to make this, this formula that includes both the protein concentration and the RNA concentration. So there's no formal dosing, but you use ROS units, which is something that you developed at Chimera. Is that correct? Well, my staff developed it and decided that they were going to call it ROS unit. <laughs> I thought that was a little strange, but if that's what they wanted, then fine. But we did need a name for this formula, you know, right. and, and, it, and it needs to be done that way. And, and the problem is that um, people are, are describing it in terms of particles, you know, and that's not valid because the water from your tap has particles in it, you know, it's very misleading. So um, it, it, a, a grain of sand won't have RNA or protein. Uh, so we need to talk about the RNA and the protein in the product. And that's how we do it. So, so a Ross unit is some measure of RNA and protein that is encapsulated within a certain number of exosomes. Well, and no, that... the number doesn't matter because if you had if you had 10 exosomes or a hundred exosomes and these 10 exosomes were really big and had a lot of stuff in them, that might be a larger ROS than a hundred small exosomes. So the formula is RNA concentration times the concentration of protein in the exosomes over the total concentration. So in that way, we're starting to bear down on what the exosome product uh, really is. So when you're delivering the product, does it, uh, it's in saline and, or, yes. and it needs to be kept frozen, cold? Frozen, right. So that's the other benefit over cells. You know, cells need to be transported in liquid nitrogen, whereas exosomes can be transported on dry ice or just regular frozen. Um, and they'll last for a period of time. I mean, at this point, dry ice is really the best temperature to keep them at. But if you had to say you're ordering them and they're arriving and you're going to use them within a week or a month, then you can keep them in your regular freezer as long as your regular freezer is cold enough, with minus 20 degrees, not minus four, not zero, you know, but minus 20. How long do they remain active? That study in rats showed that the longest period of time that you could find uh, any messenger RNA was 30 days. Um, the, if you it, look at a specific messenger RNA, say like VEGF, VEGF will only be around for four days. The half-life of VEGF is four days. If you look at the half-life of the VEGF protein, it's four hours. So that is why the messenger RNA is so much more important because over that period of four days and you know, tapering down, you're expressing thousands of proteins. So that's why no anti-tumor protein-based therapy has ever worked because the proteins just break down too quickly. But anti-cancer messenger RNA or anti-COVID messenger RNA, that is working and it's going to continue working. So that, that's the new frontier.